So welcome to our second lecture of the spring 2014 lecture series. Um, generous support from the Lowell Institute allows us to host these lectures throughout the year, free to the public, and we're thrilled to have that support from them. My name is Elizabeth Fitzsimons. I lead the outreach efforts for the Sustainable Seafood Program here at the New England Aquarium. And I'm really happy to have all of you here tonight um, for our lecture about forage fish. When I joined the team at the aquarium about four years ago, I came in with no seafood background, and so I will admit that I had no idea what a forage fish was. Um, like many of you probably are wondering, like, what are these things? Um, and that's why I'm so excited about our lecture tonight, which is forage fish now and into the future. Um, so I wanted to sort of tell you a little bit about how the evening is going to go. First, my colleague Tess Gears is going to give us all a little bit of a forage fish 101. And Tess is the perfect person to do this. She's a wild specialist, wild fishery specialist here at the aquarium. She and I work very closely together. And she's our resident expert on forage fish. Um, Tess studied marine ecology and atmospheric sciences um, at both Hamilton for her undergrad and later at Stony Brook for her master's. And while she was interning at Oceana, she sort of caught the forage fish bug. She um, worked on a very important report that they produced called Hungry Oceans, What Happens When All of the Prey is Gone? Um, remember that word, prey? It's actually going to come up a bunch of times tonight. Um, and Tess has recently had her thesis, which was about the um, Gulf of Mexico forage fisheries uh, published. So she is exactly the person to sort of help all of us understand what in the world forage fish are. Where are these fish? What are the fisheries like? Um, and to also sort of help us understand the history of forage fisheries both in the US and abroad, and the crucial role that they play in ocean ecosystems, in our fisheries, and in seaside and, and fishing economies. So Tess is going to do that, and then we're all going to be forage fish experts. And once that is done, we're going to hear from Barton Seifert, who's a familiar face to many of you who are lecture regulars. Um, Barton is our sustainability fellow in residence uh, here at the aquarium. He's also a wearer of many hats. And when he's not working with us here at the aquarium, he's the director of the Healthy and Sustainable Food Programs at the Harvard Center for Health and the Global Environment. He also was a celebrated and renowned chef for many years, um, specifically with a, a restaurant in DC called Hook, which centered around seafood, and you'll hear more about that later. Um, he is the author of several cookbooks about sustainable eating, and then in his free time, he's a National Geographic fellow, because who isn't? Um, Barton sort of has this mission of helping us to restore our relationship to the oceans and the ecosystems and sort of cultures and peoples of the world through the food that we eat. And that's a really crucial component of what we're going to talk about tonight, because Barton's going to be able to help us all understand why it's important for us as consumers, as eaters, to interact with forage fish, forage fish and forage fisheries in very different ways than we do now. And he's going to do that by looking at the way that we consume seafood now, but also sort of hearkening to the past and looking at the trends in the way that we have eaten seafood and thinking about how we can make more ocean-friendly choices, choices that are better for our forage fisheries with our fork. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Thank you all for joining us. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you guys all for coming tonight. Welcome. Um, so let's just get right into it. As Elizabeth said, uh, we're going Um, is that better? Can you hear me better now? Hmm. All right, well, I'll just try and speak up a little bit. Um, okay, so as Elizabeth said, we're going to be starting with sort of a forage fish 101, where I'm going to be talking about some of the characteristics of forage fish and their importance to the ocean ecosystem. And then I'll um, also talk about fishing for forage fish and the uh, human uses of forage fish. From there, we'll go and see um, sort of 
what, how what we learned in Forage Fish 101 plays out in the real world through some of these case studies, uh, looking at California sardines, uh, Peruvian anchovies, and Atlantic herring. And then uh, from there, we'll move on to talking about forage fish into the future. So talking about how some of those lessons that we learned from these case studies can be used to better manage forage fish in a sustainable way. And then Barton will be talking again about how uh, protein can be used more efficiently and how forage fish can be, in general can be used more efficiently. So forage fish typically are species such as sardines, herring, anchovies. Um, but what you may not realize is that they're actually not always fish. Forage fish can actually be things like krill, which are a small crustacean, or um, things like squid, certain species of squid. Um, they, one of the unique things about forage fish is that they maintain their role in the ecosystem throughout their life cycle. So unlike some species like salmon or cod that are start as um, prey when they're juveniles and become predators when they're older, forage fish are always prey species. And they're also schooling species. Um, so you may be familiar with some of these pictures of bait balls. Um, Forage fish form these large um, aggregations to protect themselves from predators, but they actually, these um, balls make them more uh, vulnerable to fishing pressure actually because it's very easy to catch these large schools of fish. Uh, one of the other characteristics of forage fish, and actually let me back up a little bit. So forage fish, the reason that they're called forage fish is because they provide forage for predators. They provide food for predators. So they're low on the food chain, um, and the reason that they're so important is because they play this important role of transferring energy uh, from the plankton, which are the small microscopic plants and animals in the ocean, up to higher level predators in the ecosystem, things such as marine mammals, um, seabirds, sharks, um, and species like that. Uh, Another characteristic of forage fish is that they typically um, have a low diversity in the ecosystem, so you'll usually only find one or two forage fish species in any given ecosystem. But although they have a low diversity, they have a very high biomass or volume in the ecosystem. So usually, those one or two forage species will have the largest, be the largest volume of fish in that ecosystem. The role of forage fish in ecosystems has really become an important topic in um, scientific study recently, and there have been some, several prominent studies that have shown how, just how important forage fish are to the ecosystems. So this study um, behind me is on, was just published in Science a few years ago, and it, talks, it looked at how uh, seabirds respond to forage fish population decline. And what this study found was that, in general, we need to leave about one-third of forage fish biomass or um, volume in the oceans for seabirds in order for them to have uh, healthy reproduction. Another prominent study was published just recently by the Lenfest Forage Fish Task Force um, in the Pew Charitable Trust. And this study looked at ecosystems all over the world. And what it found was that predators that are heavily uh, reliant on forage fish are found in ecosystems all over the world. It's not just unique to certain ecosystems. And these predators include anything from uh, whales to penguins to tuna, many different types of predators. And this study just came out recently, just this year. Um, this was actually looking at how important forage fish are to global fisheries. So forage fish are important to other fisheries because they provide the prey that those fish actually eat. Um, so in that way, they sustain other fisheries. A few more things that characterize forage fish. Um, one of them is that their populations uh, expand and contract very rapidly. So this graph here is showing uh, the populations of anchovies in the dark line here and sardines. Um, over a 50-year time period from 1950 to through 2000. Uh, and this is actually a graph of landings of catch, but this is reflective of the abundance of these species as well. And so as you can see here, uh, around 1955, this anchovy population increased very rapidly and then decreased. It was followed by an increase and decrease in the sardine abundance. 
So these populations are very strongly influenced by environmental conditions. So again, looking at this top graph, um, these vertical bars here are actually El Nino events. Now, El Nino um, happens when there's a warming of, in the, of the water in the Central Pacific Ocean. And this water pushes towards the coast of South America, and it replaces the cold water. By replacing this cold water, it changes the um, production of phytoplankton. And phytoplankton are those small microscopic plants. And those are the things that anchovy feed on. But, so by changing the phytoplankton production, you're changing uh, the anchovy populations in that area. So we have these El Nino events that occur. The darker ones are the stronger El Ninos. And these influence the anchovy populations here and here. Now, forage fish are also influenced by much longer term climate cycles. So the El Ninos occur um, anywhere from every five to seven years, and they last for a year or two, sometimes less. But there are other cycles that last for much longer. So these cycles occur over 15 to 30 year time periods. And these also influence the temperature in the ocean and make con conditions either good or bad for certain species. Um, so this graph here is showing the cycle, the long-term cycle of anchovy and sardines that's reflected up here in this graph. So during the cooler periods, anchovies are dominant, and during the warmer periods, sardines are dominant. So forage fish are important not only to global, to the ecosystems, but they're also important to um, human food systems and economies. If we look at the top 10 species in this, um, in the chart here at the top, that were landed in 2011, globally, uh, four of those species are actually forage fish. So we're talking about anchovy in Peru, um, Atlantic herring, caught in the North Atlantic Ocean, Japanese anchovy, which is caught in the Northwestern Pacific Ocean, and European pilchard, or sardine, which is caught in the Northeast Atlantic. And looking at that in terms of um, sort of the percent that those species compose, so there, it's four out of 10 of the top, four out of 10 of the top 10 species are forage fish. But in terms of volume, more than 50% of those top 10 species are forage fish. The rest are made up mostly of whitefish species and tuna species. So they're important globally to fisheries, but they're also important in US fisheries. Um, the most important, or sorry, the second most important fishery in the United States is for Gulf menhaden. Uh, this is a forage species that's caught in the Gulf of Mexico. And you may not be familiar with it because we don't actually eat it here in the United States or anywhere really directly. Uh, menhaden are used almost exclusively for um, fish, fish meal and fish oil, and are also used as bait. Um, so we don't eat them directly, which is why you may not have heard of this fishery. So that's the Gulf Menhaden here in the um, Gulf of Mexico. Another major forage fish fishery in the United States is the Atlantic Menhaden fishery, as well as the Atlantic herring fishery. And then on the west coast, we have the um, Pacific herring fisheries, Pacific sardine fisheries, and some squid fisheries. So what do we use all this forage fish for that we caught? Well, it's actually a little bit difficult to tell uh, where, the forage, where the fish go after we catch them. But it's estimated that about one third of all the wild fish caught in the world is used for non-food purposes. So um, most of it goes towards reduction and some of it goes towards direct animal feeding as well as bait and uh, use in canned pet food. So as I said, um, reduction is the process of um, processing fish from uh, the whole live fish into fish meal and fish oil. And so most, that's what most of this non-food um, use goes towards. Now, back in the, around the 1980s, um, most of the fish meal, somewhere around 60%, uh, went towards um, poultry and uh, pig feed. Now that has changed and about 60% of fish meal goes towards aquaculture, whereas about 20% goes towards feeding pigs 
and 13% goes towards feeding chickens. In terms of fish oil, today about 75% of that goes towards aquaculture and um, about 15% goes towards uh, direct human consumption uh, through things like um, fish oil supplements. And although we don't, there's not good statistics on sort of exactly what um, percentage of the fish, of forage fish goes towards reduction, it's estimated that about 80% of those catches are processed for reduction. So again, this is um, not going towards direct human consumption. This is something that Barton's going to touch on a bit later. So bringing all of those sort of facts and figures, I want to bring that kind of home through a few case studies. So we're going to start with probably one of the most iconic forage fish fisheries in the United States. Uh, this is the California sardine fishery, it, which um, happened off the coast of Monterey in the early 1920s. Um, and this was made most famous through um, John Steinbeck's novel, Canary Row. So the um, California sardine fishery began during World War I as a way to feed our soldiers. Um, and then the fishery really increased rapidly after that. By 1940, it accounted for approximately 25% of all of the fish landed in the United States. But by the 1950s, just 10 years later, the fishery had almost entirely collapsed. Now, this is most likely partly due to the rapid increase in fishing, but we now know that this collapse was also related to environmental conditions. So, um, again, this is looking at these sort of long-term climate cycles, and here we see this graph up here at the top is showing the warm periods and the cool periods in the northern Pacific Ocean. And so in around the 1930s and 1940s, when, this, when the South California sardine fishery was really increasing, that was a really good environmental conditions for sardines during this warm period. But then around the 1950s, when that fishery collapsed, the ocean temperatures changed and it became cooler, which is poor environmental conditions for sardines. Um, so we know that the collapse was related to environmental conditions, but we also know that the fishery does influence that collapse. So um, when you're fishing, when you're overfishing at a time that the climate regime is changing and the environmental conditions are poor, it can really um, make that collapse more rapid and it can also extend the recovery period. So as you can see in this bottom graph, after the fishery collapsed, it took a very long time, this is about 40, 30 to 40 years, for the um, sardine populations to really come back at all. This is the abundance of sardines. And they didn't really start coming back until the 1990s. And even then, they didn't come back to the levels that we saw back in the 1930s. So we do know that stocks can recover from collapse, but it's important to manage them appropriately. So looking at Canary Row today, it's a very different place than it was back in Steinbeck's time. Um, but sardines are managed in a much more precautionary way. There are upper limits to how much we can catch, no matter how much there are, how abundant they are. And there are lower limits, so um, once the fishery, or once the abundance reaches a certain low level, the fishing is halted completely. Um, management also accounts, accounts for environmental variability, so when the conditions are poor for sardines, they reduce the catch preemptively. So we're gonna rewind a little again back to 1960. I'm sure you guys all remember that fondly. Um, so as you'll remember, we just talked about the sardine fishery had just collapsed and um, the climate uh, conditions in the Pacific had just switched over to a cooler period. World War II had recently ended, and with that came a rapid ex um, expansion of the poultry and swine industries, or pig industries, in the United States. And that also um, facilitated a large expansion of technology in the fishing fleet. So they started using things like sonar, and they had vacuums to suck out the fish from their nets, and just in general had much bigger nets and much larger boats. So into that atmosphere enters the Peruvian anchovy. So this fish is found off the coast of Peru and Chile. And 
Um, this fishery really increased rapidly in that period from sort of 1950, 1960 to 1970, just in 10 years. But as you may guess, that didn't last very long. That fishery collapsed after just 10 years, um, 10 to 15 years. So again, this was a result of multiple factors. It was not just the the fishing, it was not just environmental conditions. There are likely a number of things that played into this. Um, there were management measures that were put into place sort of around 1970, but this was too little too late, and um, it was also not well enforced. So in general, the reasons for the collapse are likely um, overfishing, as well as a strong El Nino event. So again, this... Uh, here, this El Nino event occurred in 1972 and 1973. And that really resulted in very poor environmental conditions for the anchovy. And so their reproduction was uh, inhibited that year. And as in combination with the fishing, it drove down the populations. In addition, as I um, spoke about earlier, the El Nino causes the warm water to push towards the Peruvian coast, and it really concentrates certain pockets of cold water along the coast. And this is where all of the anchovies aggregate. Even as their populations are declining, they tend to aggregate in these small cold water pools. And so it's actually very easy for the fisheries to, to for the fishermen to find them um, because they're really concentrated in these pools. So even as their populations are declining, it's really easy to continue fishing them. And then at that same, during that same period, we had sort of a shift to overall different environmental conditions. So at this time, we shifted to sort of, in general, unfavorable environmental conditions for anchovies, which is generally a warmer period, as well as having several other El Nino events during this period that um, kept the populations down. So what impact did this have on the ecosystem? Well, anchovies are very important in the Peruvian ecosystem. Just about everything there eats them, at least to some degree. Um, some of the biggest predators are a number of different seabirds as well as marine mammals. And some of these populations are really strongly influenced by the changes in anchovy populations. One in particular is the guana and cormorant. So this graph here is showing the um, population of guana and cormorants over time. And there are a few important spots on this graph that I want to show you. So uh, one is here in around 1957, 1958. There was an El Nino event that occurred there. Anchovy populations declined, the cormorants declined, but that was at the beginning of the fishery and there was still plenty of anchovy out there. So the cormorants were able to increase again after that. However, in the mid 1960s, there was another El Nino event. This was at the peak of the anchovy fishery. So not only was there an El Nino causing the anchovy populations to decline, but there was also a very large fishery occurring at that time. And so there just wasn't enough fish out there for the cormorants. Um, and so their populations declined and really never recovered. Now some species are actually able to um, better utilize different prey resources. So this is the case of the um, Peruvian booby. And so this species, you'll see some of the same points on this graph as with the cormorant. Here in the early 1950s, it or in the 1950s, it declined due to that El Nino, and it again declined here during this El Nino. But at this time, it was able to sort of recover and sustain itself on the available anchovy. And then despite this El Nino here, it started taking advantage of this um, increase in sardine populations that occurred here. And so it was actually able to increase. And then during this really strong El Nino that happened here, its populations declined. But again, there was prey available uh, afterwards, both sardines and then anchovies later. And so its population was able to recover. So currently, we're in this another anchovy regime here where we have sort of generally cooler water temperatures in the Pacific near Peru. And this is a good environmental conditions for anchovies. Uh, it's possible though that we might see a shift back to sardines soon um, because this sort of anchovy regime has been happening for quite a long time. And there's also an El Nino predicted for this year which might impact the fishery. But 
one of the good things is that there's much better management now in the fishery. And uh, even when El Nino events happen, like this one in 1997 and 96 and 98, uh, as long as there's good management in place and the environmental conditions are okay, the populations can really come back. However, we know that we can still really improve this uh, for, from an ecosystem perspective. So again, looking at those bird populations in Peru, some of them never recovered, and it's really important to uh, take that into account in managing the fishery. So to bring this back a little bit closer to home, uh, we'll look at Atlantic herring, which is caught here in New England, mostly in uh, Maine and Massachusetts, as well as a little bit in Rhode Island. And they're caught using midwater trawlers and purse seines, which are these really large vessels that are able to catch pretty large schools all at once. We use herring primarily for bait, mostly for lobster bait. Um, some amount of it goes towards direct human consumption, but even most of this is exported. And then a small proportion of it goes for other uses, such as feeding our animals here at the aquarium. So Atlantic herring is a species that we've actually been studying for quite a long time, and we have a pretty good understanding of what its role is in the ecosystem. We know that over the last few decades, predator consumption has varied between about 200,000 and 600,000 metric tons. And that's on average about two and a half times what is, or about two times what we catch in the fishery. So they're very important for the predators here in New England, in particular for certain other iconic New England species, such as Atlantic cod. So this is the consumption of Atlantic herring in New England um, by different fish species. So back, the little, the light blue here is the consumption of cod. So back in the 1970s, cod were eating a lot of herring. That's shifted a little bit as cod populations have declined. And now a lot of the consumption of herring is with um, by striped bass, as well as spiny dogfish, and at certain points by, also by goosefish or monkfish. Another important predator of herring here is the Atlantic puffins and other seabird species uh, around New England. So the Atlantic puffin is a threatened species, and it's hypothesized that um, part of the uh, decline in, in breeding populations is due to the lack of herring right around their nesting areas. So although herring populations are abundant, they may not be abundant in the right places. Um, so again, it's important to manage those fisheries to consider predators' needs on different time scales and in certain areas. So as I said, this is actually a fairly well-managed fishery here in New England, but of course there's always still work that can be done. And one of the concerns in this fishery is bycatch, and that's the catch of um, a species that you're not targeting in the fishery. Um, bycatch in the herring fishery includes some ground fish species, such as cod, as well as uh, other river herring species, which are both overfished. And as I said, it's important for the management to explicitly take predator needs into account on a spatial scale, um, managing certain closed areas as well as certain closed time periods to make sure that there's enough fish there when the um, birds are reproducing. And although we do know quite a bit about this, um, about herring and about this fishery, it's always important to collect more information and to be monitoring the fishery. Uh, so one of the things that we can do is increase observer coverage in the fishery. Observers are non-fishermen that go out and collect data on the fishery, and so adding observer coverage in the fishery will really help us collect more information. So going forward, um, and thinking about some of those lessons that we've learned from these case studies, and how we can use those lessons to think about managing forage fish more sustainably. So we know now that forage fish populations are highly vulnerable to fishing. Uh, despite sort of the fact that we used to think that, is this still on? It is, but it sounds different. Oh, Can great. people still hear? Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so despite the fact that uh, these forage fish populations can become very abundant, we do know that they're vulnerable to fishing. So. Um, for one thing, they can become concentrated and make it easier to fish, even when their populations are low. Uh, and they can also, we also know that by uh, putting heavy fishy, fishing pressure on them as environmental conditions are uh, degrading, it can really increase um, 
the, how quickly they decline, as well as extend their period of recovery. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we also know that their abundance is uh, highly variable and somewhat unpredictable. So although we know that they are affected by different uh, environmental conditions, both on short-term and long-term time scales, we don't always know what those are going to be, and we don't always know how impacted they're going to be by that. So it's important to take that into account. And we also know that forage fish are important players in the ecosystems that they are part of, and it's important to consider this. So after decades of watching these fisheries uh, expand and then collapse, we now have a much better idea of how to manage them, which is good. Hopefully we can learn our lesson. Um, again, it's important to manage the expansion of forage fish fishing capacity. This is important not only for the ecosystem, but also for fishing communities. Uh, fishing communities are just as impacted by these rapid expansions of the fishery and collapse. Fishing communities can also collapse. And livelihoods can disappear when you sort of have this rapid increase and then decrease in the fishing industry. It's also important to manage the fishing based on environmental conditions. So if we think that the environmental conditions are going to be poor for forage fish, we can take a precautionary approach and limit the fishing ahead of time so that those fish populations can recover more quickly. And it's also important to restrict fishing so that there's enough for predators, especially at certain times and in certain places. And in the end, it's important for us to remember that ecosystem-based management includes not only predator-prey interactions, but also the habitats that they live in, as well as us, the humans that are uh, using these ecosystems. So with that, I will turn it over to Art. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thanks so much for uh, having me back here. What a fabulous uh, job you did explaining this. I have the uh, opportunity to talk really about what these fish mean to us. Uh, we have really good understanding now of what they mean within the ecosystem. But uh, we live in a world of 7 billion people that's growing to 9 billion people, some say 10 billion people. And the question is constantly asked, how are we going to feed all of them? And uh, I think that, asks, uh, that begs us to look at every resource that we have and to think seriously if we are using that for its highest and best purpose. And forage fish really, really represents, represents to me, me thank you, You're welcome. Uh, really one of the very best opportunities that we have to make better use of the products that we already have. You know, we live in a finite planet. However, we uh, are proving that we are not very good at placing finite limits on ourselves. So, the, the sort of the mission of sustainability is to better nourish people with the foods that we already have. To take the environments and our access to them and create opportunities for humans to thrive, not only in terms of health, but in terms of uh, economics, and also in terms of protecting their cultures and heritage, allowing people, you know, creating systems that allow people to practice their livelihoods and their cultures in ways that they see fit. So sustainability is not just about sustainable production. And oftentimes when we look at sustainability, we're talking about is this fish sustainable or not? Green list, red list, okay. You know, it's produced sustainably, therefore it's a good product. What's left out of that conversation is behavioral sustainability. What do we do with that product? Do we use it sustainably? Is that sustainably farm-raised salmon put on a plate with plenty of brown rice, lots of broccoli, crispy kale, a nice pistachio orange pesto, all delivered with a hint of uh, you know, aromatic olive oil, with rice pudding, and almonds and raisins for dessert. Oh yeah, okay, yes, you use that salmon sustainably. Did you eat a salmon steak for dinner the size of your face? Well, you probably enjoyed it, but that's probably not the highest and best use of that product. So we must also look at sustainable usage of products as much as we look at sustainable production. And that really, I think, talks to a lot of what we've heard about forage fish. For basically uh, the past couple of centuries, we've looked at forage fish only as a, an ingredient within an industrial process. We haven't looked at them uh, for what they can truly provide for us, which is amazingly good, healthy sustenance. They can provide for us jobs and opportunity. And the first thing I want to go back, the first fishery that I want to go back to is the Anchoveta fishery. 
This fishery, uh, you know, the numbers that Tess uh, put forth, this fishery represents uh, on some years 10 to 15 percent of the entire global wild capture of fish. 10 to 15 percent. One fish, one country. That's an incredible, incredible amount of biomass. It's an incredible amount of food. 98% of that never feeds a human being. It's caught in these vessels that are so big, 165 feet long, that they can't get but within you know, a half, uh, half mile of the shore. See that pipeline there? That's exactly what it is. It's a pipeline going out to these boats to suck in the, uh, the fish from the holds of these vessels, put them through a mill, and then put them into this crock pot down here, the, the likes of which you've never seen on Home Shopping Network. The other thing is 60 yards across, and it sits there just milling it down until that oil is separated out. The fish meal then ends up on these trucks and burlap sacks. The fish oil goes into other industrial production. You know, if we're talking about how do we feed people, and this is the system that we're building for it, this is not the highest and best use of this resource. And by the way, this plant that uh, these pictures are taken in uh, is down in, uh, in uh, Pisco. And I was down there, and this plant processes 14,000 tons of inchvetta per day. And it employs 28 people. 12 of them are security guards, purposed with keeping people like me out. <laughs> now, that's just not what I think of when, when I think of dinner. Also, by the way, the cost per pound that those vessels are getting, six cents or less per pound of anchovy. By the way, anchovies have one of the highest contents of omega-3s, absolutely negligible biotoxicity to them, clean, lean, delicious protein. Come over to my house. I'll convince you they're the best thing you've ever eaten. And you know where I'm going to get that product from? My friend Manuel, who runs a pro who runs a factory right down the street at Pisco. Here in his factory, he produces the anchovies that you know. Roland, Cento, Progresso, I mean, you name it. You've seen these. They're in the little two-ounce tins. They're for sale everywhere. This factory processes two tons of anchovies per day. Two tons! It employs 150 people. Each of those fillets filleted by hand. This is creating livable wage jobs off of a resource. And when you start looking at the number of people, the, the opportunities that they need and the resources available to create those opportunities, 14,000 metric tons for 28 jobs, or two tons for 150. This is using the product to best sustain communities, people, and the opportunity to thrive. Now, that sort of story is replicated over and over again. You know, when we look at sustainability, not just in terms of how we impact an environment to, to its detriment, and therefore sustainability is our effort to mitigate that detriment, we also have to look at sustainability as a, as a positive. How are we impacted by that environment? How many jobs did it create? Is the culture intact? Are people healthy because of the products that are provided? In this example, yes. In this example, no. So let's look at some of the other fisheries that Tess was talking about. The herring. I think herring are absolutely fantastic. There are parts of the world where they celebrate herring. There are herring days. Kids get out of, kids get out of school because the first herring coming in in a barrel and they get to eat them raw. I mean, it's crazy. This is part of the culture. There's a celebration of, of the return of spring and herring in Norway and Denmark. But here, we take herring, perfectly good, utterly delicious fish that we used to put into canneries that lined the New England coast, provided jobs. Now we put them into lobster pots. Now, I got nothing wrong with the lobster industry. I got nothing wrong with, with the way that operates. But the evidence suggests that for every pound of lobster we catch, eight pounds of herring, and some evidence suggests even up to 15 pounds of herring are used to capture that. Now, just think about this. I mean, you've got $10 to spend. Do you want 10 pounds of herring or do you want one lobster? Now, we're all in this room probably saying, yeah, lobster sounds pretty good to me, right? There's a lot of people in this world that don't have that option. And the herring really is the better opportunity there. And again, I'm not vilifying the lobster industry. I'm just saying that we have built economies based on using, process, using uh, resources uh, in ways that don't reflect their highest and best use. Uh, wicked tuna. 
National Geographic television show. You ever seen that? And uh, you may you know, think what you will of that, but there's all these, these great scenes, these salty guys are like, yeah, we're gonna catch a lot of today, yeah, 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 yeah. And they're just like sitting there chopping up fish and tossing it overboard. And that's the only part of that show that I really just can't stomach. Taking perfectly good fish, chopping it up, and literally throwing it overboard, and just like, they have a dinner, they have a dinner. It was so tasty, these herring, bluefish, I've seen them chopping up. Yes, to catch a bluefin that's worth tons of money. But again, we've just sort of created these irrational economies in which we've, we've sort of foregone really looking at our use of this product rationally. Now, uh, the Menhaden as well, which was mentioned. Uh, I come from the Chesapeake Bay area, and down there, that's the second biggest uh, Menhaden fishery. Down there, 434 million pounds of Menhaden are taken out in uh, 2010. 434 million pounds of fish worth a total of $34 million. Are you kidding me? Fish. Good edible protein that can save the life of hungry people. And it's worth $34 million. I mean, that, that, we're not creating the best economic opportunity out of this as well. And so I'm looking at this not, you know, let's catch less fish. Let's catch fish and put them to better use. Now, what we eat makes a real difference. And the test focused a little bit on this, uh, you know, as, as the trophic scale in, in the oceans works. You have your photosynthetic phytoplankton, phyto, uh, phytoplankton, phyto zooplankton, all the way at the bottom. And that's the majority of the biomass in the ocean. That uh, converts contemporary energy of the sun into the basis of the marine food chain. Your forage fish, your filter feeders, that's what they eat. One step up, you've got your mackerels, you've got your detrivores, uh, a lot of the fish that we tend to eat. And then all the way up at the very top, you've got your carnivorous species. I mean, you've got your salmons, you've got your marlin, sharks, swordfish, the things that we love to sit down to a restaurant and eat a big steak of. But if you look at this and, and think about the marine trophic scale is like a diving board. And you've got your phytoplankton, your zooplankton right down here at the base of it. And you've got your marlin, sharks all the way out the end. What happens if you jump at the very end of a diving board? Your system creates the biggest splash. You leverage that system to create the biggest reaction. What happens if you jump at the very base of it? Nothing. The system absorbs your shock. And unfortunately, our preferences for seafood tend to fall right here. Hammering, hammering, hammering away down at the very tip, causing the biggest splash we can in that ocean. Now, I don't have any good recipes for phytoplankton. I hope that uh, in my lifetime, and the lifetime of my children, that we won't have to. But oysters, clams, mussels, anchovies, sardines, herring, woo! That's a good meal to me. And I'd, I'd rather take 100 pounds of mussels, anchovies, sardines, than I would a one pound of tuna. Think about that inefficiency as you go up the line. So what we eat does matter in terms of the cost that we are placing upon the ocean. But what do we eat? We eat 10 species. Americans eat somewhere between 14 and a half and 16 pounds of seafood a year, roughly. And, you know, it varies every year. These are the top 10 species that we eat. Represents over 95% of total consumption. This list doesn't really change year to year. And if you notice, top three species alone make up more than 65% of our entire consumption. Three species. Now, that's not what the oceans look like, though. That's what the oceans look like. You know, you've been to Verona, you've been to Italy, France, I mean, Spain, Africa, where I used to live and work. This is what a fish market should look like, right? Should reflect the ocean. Except for maybe the seal and the unfortunate marine mammals that are in there. I mean, this is 15th century, so give them a, give them a break there. But there's diversity, and we should be eating broadly across the whole spectrum. But we tend to just stick with our favorites. Now, what that's led to is a theory called fishing down the food web. And this is uh, presented by Daniel Pauly in the slides from him. Basically, we really like the big charismatic species in the ocean. Well, hey, we liked them on land too. What were the first things to go extinct once man showed up? The big, the slow, the dumb, and the tasty. Well, I won't call the fish dumb, but they're, they're big and they're tasty. And those are the first ones to go. And what we're seeing now is that the fish that are remaining in the ocean are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. 
And so we are actually creating an ocean ecosystem that is full of smaller fish than there used to be. But what's really interesting about this diagram to me is that it represents in reverse our cultural preferences for seafood. There's a study called a Recipe for Rarity done by the University of Washington. They looked at cookbooks that were published over an 11 decade period. So for 110 years, they looked at the trophic level of the, of the seafood species featured. So where on the food chain it sits. And they found that over 11, 110 years, our preference for seafood jumped by almost three quarters of a full trophic step. A lot of that was due to technology. You know, we all of a sudden had boats that could get far, far away. We had refrigeration. We had, we had freezing. We had all these technologies that did open up new options. But when you go to a restaurant, what are you looking for? You want a big steak. We think about fish, you know, as a celebratory thing. Okay, we like those things up there. 110 years ago, you know, we actually really like those things down there. You know why? Because if you're hungry, just wait. They're going to swim towards you pretty soon. Shad, alewife, herring, smelts, mussels, clams, oysters. You hungry? Wait till low tide. It'll be fine. It'll be right out there. But we shifted through technology our preferences. And our preferences, our culinary preferences, which are purely our choice, are now driving an irrational economy that takes a, a seafood market that should look like this and makes it look like that. Now, the thing about it is all of the fish down over there, they're delicious. You want omega-3s? You should start there. You want a good, cheap, accessible, affordable protein? Start there. You know this whole argument that you know, good, sustainable food is inaccessible and this is an elitist concern? Those fish are for sale at gas stations. I mean, literally, you can get a can of pink salmon or sardines or, or andro, literally at gas stations. This food is accessible, this food is healthy. And what's amazing is that we have the opportunity to shift our preferences back towards this. And that doesn't mean that we're gonna take more of them out of the ocean. It means that we're gonna make better use of those that we already are taking out of the ocean. Thus leading to a more inherently sustainable relationship throughout the entire ocean food chain. Now I ran restaurants for uh, a number of years and. I had uh, a policy. I worked with 13 fishermen directly. And I, I had a rule. I, I, would, I would buy what they caught. Well, that's pretty simple, right? I mean, they're going out fishing on my behalf to provide food for my business so I can provide food for your table. Who am I to say, ah, I'm not going to take that. I only want this and I want that. Cost them the same to catch everything, right? There were very few exceptions I didn't take. Sharks, marlins, things that were inherently susceptible to overfishing. But other than that, I basically took it, and it was my job to sell it. And so I had to be very honest. I had to really entertain people. I mean, in the first year we were open, we served 78 different species of seafood because I bought what they, what they caught. We had more Audubon guides in my kitchen. We had cookbooks. I mean, Bach opened the box and was like, oh, crap, another ichthyology lesson. Here we go. And, but that's what we did. And people became enamored with this. They would come back, on, you know, they'd come in on Tuesday for a rainbow runner and grunt. And they'd be like, oh, God, this is so cool. And then they'd bring their friends in on Thursday, and we'd have horse mackerel and, and, and brotula or whatever it was. Always something new. And what was so amazing is that we turned people on to the fact that every fish along this whole chain is equally delicious if you give it a chance to be what it is. And the best story I have representing this is one day, Thursday night, at 600 reservations on the books. I'm already pulling my hair out, trying to you know, just shoot me now. You got all my fish coming in. Yeah, it's just a busy day. And uh, one of my fish purveyors hadn't shown up yet. It's the FedEx box. I'm supposed to be getting it up from Tobago. And supposed to be there by 11 a.m. Didn't show, didn't show, didn't show. I finally called him up. I was like, Mike, come on, you're killing me. Like, where are my fish? And finally it comes through the door. And I open the box, and my reaction was, what the? that. Well, I was used to seeing some different stuff, but I was like, God. So I called up Michael and I was like, nice as I could be. I was like, Michael, <laughs> what did you send me? He said, well, you know, the guys went out, they had a bad day fishing. You know, they just couldn't catch anything. But I, you know, I like you, so I didn't want to leave you in a lurch. So, uh, well, we just packaged up and sent you all the leftover bait. <laughs> I had 85 pounds of flying fish in a box. It's Thursday afternoon, 4.30, and I've got 600 reservations sitting down in an hour. 
You ever tried flying a fish? It's not, not really intuitive. It's pretty hard, right? All right, throw some wing bone structure in there. And Strat is just like, are you, yeah. You know what I did? Flayed them all up. I, uh, I think I did something. I flayed them all up. I uh, made them up into little like roll mops, marinated them with tarragon, lemon zest, little olive oil, slow smoldered them over a wood fire grill, nice and smoky, put them over a bowl of uh, yellow summer squash braised in a Vidalia onion and juniper broth, put a little uh, tarragon shallot salad on top, sold it for $23, $24. You know what I told my staff? The truth. You know what my staff did? They went out to every single table, Oh my God, you'll never guess what happened. Oh my God, like, oh, blah, 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 blah. Told the whole story. I sold all 85 pounds by 7.30 that night. I had people coming to me for two years asking for more flying fish. <laughs> Mind you, I couldn't get any more because the fishermen thought I was an idiot for even asking for it. But these are the opportunities that we have to use what the ocean affords us. For too long, we've created these irrational economies where we've told the oceans and fishermen what we're willing to eat instead of asking them what they're willing to provide. And the oceans can provide more forage fish at a better price, at a healthier experience from our body than any other form of fish in the ocean. And so we need to create a rational economy in which we ask the ocean what it can provide, ask fishermen what they are able to sell because that's what they caught. And so all of these fish taste good. All of these fish, you know, have a place in our cultural pantheon. Something that I saw uh, in Tessa's presentation, you noticed that uh, when the sardines bottomed out and there was that flat line for about 30 to 40 years and then it comes back up, sardines were the most popular seafood in America. Then the fish crashed. Two generations went by. Now you can't get anybody to eat them, even though they're back. That's a generational preference. We just lost that opportunity. The fish didn't change. Processing didn't change. This is us. This is a consumer opportunity. And this is the cheapest, most accessible, affordable fish that we have access to. And so none of this is new. The ideas that we need to put in place, that, that we need to practice in order to create a sustainable relationship with our ocean to make fisheries, once again, a viable source of food, to restore the pride, the prudence, the profitability, and the permanence of our fisheries, both local and global. What we need to do is, is purely a consumer choice. It's in our opportunity. The United States Food Administration, anybody remember that? It was 1907, this poster was printed. You can live by these words today and do very well by yourself. So. With that, again, I sort of state that our purpose in environmental sustainability, our purpose in managing fisheries and interacting with the oceans is to best sustain people in environments managed for abundance, not managed for scarcity, and to create opportunity for all of us to thrive. So thank you, and thank you. So I'm going to leave that up there, and I am going to take some questions. And please, uh, I'm going to uh, ask you to stand up, read the question, and then I'll repeat it, and then uh, Ms. Tess will deliver her brilliance in answer. <laughs> Sir. So have you heard of the South African company, AgroProtein? Have I heard of the South African company, AgroProtein? Uh, no. Can you, do you, would you care to explain? Cool. Uh, for those of you who couldn't hear, uh, it's an operation that is uh, farming maggots off of uh, industrial cattle waste and processing uh, effluent. And the maggots, uh, it's amazing, they create all the protein needed to go into, uh, to replace fish meal 
uh, and they also uh, actually reduce disease vectors within the cattle population, thus leading to a host of benefits uh, with decreased prophylactic antibiotic use. I mean, it's a fabulous thing. And the only reason why we're not doing it is because we have this silly little taboo that somehow, you know, that's not fit for us. And, uh, but that's the wave of the future, absolutely, and good technology. The smartest person in the room is always nature, so it's uh, allowing allowing her systems to to work and, and just really basically standing out of the way. I mean that's uh, it, it's pretty amazing what uh, what it's capable of doing the resiliency of it. You know anything else? Do you know much of that? No, I don't know about that specific instance, but um, there is a lot of research being done to look at different ways that we can improve. Um, feed for aquaculture and for other species, partly because it's becoming so expensive. Um, but yeah, it would be great if we can find technologies, or not technologies, <laughs> natural uh, ways of doing that that can increase the efficiency. The next obvious question is why aren't we eating the bugs? <laughs> Which many, many cultures do, so. Question over here, yes ma'am. We both have a lot to say about this. <laughs> Jess, go ahead. Um, there's no easy answer to that, um, but picking one or the other is not the answer, I think. <laughs> um, both wild caught fish and uh, farmed fish can be produced sustainably. It depends on how they're managed, it depends on how the farms are run, and um, it depends on what kind of species that we're utilizing. So. Both in aquaculture and in wild fisheries, as Spartan was talking about, we can eat lower on the food chain. Um, eating lower on the food chain from wild fisheries improves the efficiency, and eating lower on the food chain in farm species can also increase the efficiency. I, uh, it's our patriotic duty to eat as many farm-raised shellfish, clams, mussels, and oysters as you possibly can, uh, domestically produced ones especially. It's the only thing I recommend outright over consumption of because it's actually a restorative system in that it, it, it re replenishes uh, the health of, of ecosystems and of waterfront communities. Uh, but the other part of that question, uh, you know, what is the decision process between buying wild and farmed, uh, is what are the other products that you might buy instead of fish? And that doesn't often come up. And if you look at, uh, there's a number of sites, Environmental Working Group has a great one, you know, climate change and increased carbon dioxide within the oceans leading to acidification is arguably possibly the greatest threat facing our oceans. Uh, and a huge amount of our global greenhouse gas emissions are coming from livestock production. And so oftentimes, you know, if you don't buy the seafood, uh, especially in, 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 uh, in lower income markets, you, you might be buying the ground beef, which is uh, not as healthful of a choice and can be argued uh, using different metrics that it's not nearly as environmentally friendly as well. So when we ask ourselves these questions, we also need to think in terms of the, of the entire context of, of our actions. Yes, and then up to you. Please. Uh, I see two problems. For us to move in the direction where you'd like us to move, and they are parallel and very different. The problem is, uh, how do you convince people to start eating those bottle feeders? Because it's a cultural perception that we have. On the other hand, people like myself, I'm a home cook, not, not, not a, a, a chef. I don't find the stuff that I like to cook. I go to Whole Foods and I see all the same stuff over and over, and very little of what I'm looking for. Which one is the easiest to solve? Uh, I think they both take uh, effort. <laughs> that just added, added <laughs> gravitas to the answer that I'm about to give. So uh, they both take an equal measure. As I said, you know, sardines were, were the, once the most popular seafood in America, and 
uh, by lack of access, generations were not introduced to that. Uh, monkfish, lobster uh, were, were considered, you know, there's a, a law on the books in Massachusetts that says indentured servants shall not be fed lobster more than three times a week. Thank God we got rid of the indentured servants part, and, but you know, their uh, tastes change. And there are countries all over the world, cultures that value these small, uh, you know, you know, more full flesh, full flavored fish, more than they do the the white flesh fish that we we prefer. And in terms of access, uh, only fresh cut flowers it ranks in terms of perishability with seafood. And so restaurants, uh, seafood markets have absolutely no incentive to bring in something that they hope somebody might ans ask for. And so it's going to take a concerted effort over the course of time, uh, asking uh, for diversity within the markets. And it's not overnight, but one of the other things you can do is participate in community supported fisheries uh, by telling a fisherman locally, I will buy what you catch, and then figuring out how to cook it. So, but great points, thank you. One more question up in the back. Well, thank you for asking. I do have two cookbooks available in the gift shop. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, there, there are plenty. Uh, you know, from pink salmon cakes, uh, pink salmon melts made much like you would uh, with tuna. Uh, with anchovies, sardines, uh, simmering them into a tomato sauce, just as a simple Tuesday night tomato sauce. Uh, the flavor tends to just blend right in and disappear, delivering the, the protein and the omega-3s uh, without, without that sort of focal point of the fish flavor. Um, uh, pink salmon is another one. It's, it's, uh, it's, the, yeah, it's one of the most commonly available uh, uh, canned species. Uh, pink salmon is is not as high. It, it I mean, I I took us out of the, the <laughs> forage fish there, but it is uh, sort of in the common. It is seen commonly in the vein of uh, canned seafood and sort of what you're after and recipes to introduce those flavors to people. Um, but uh, you know, my one of my favorite things: a piece of uh, toasted rye bread, a fresh avocado mashed down, slices of smoked uh, sardines on top, a little bit of vinegar or hot sauce, and pretty happy. Um, you can also find some recipes on the New England Aquarium's website at www.neaq.org slash seafood. Sir, yes. Uh, I, I, I'm not an expert on the history of that industry, but uh, the efficiency that is realized uh, in pushing that, that uh, capture into the, the reduction market, it is so easy. You don't, because the, the market is based on volume, being able to take very good care uh, of each fish and delivering it to market in high quality where it's still going to be a appealing in a fresh state is very hard. It takes a lot of labor. And so uh, I think that there was an alternate market available that you know, was less costly to buy into, uh, that had a, uh, a consistent return. Uh, and there was also at the same time uh, the, ex the explosion of the, of the global salmon market. And no right around you know, 1955 is when the improving answer that to Fishery really took off. 1960 was when Norway really started in with uh, salmon farming, um, uh, you know, and, and the introduction of uh, animal feeds into into poultry and livestock production. So there's a couple of confluent confluencing factors there, um, but you know, still even efforts now to gain more of that fish into the human direct human consumption market uh, are finding difficulty of buy-in because it requires. Uh, tender care of the fish it requires smaller boats, which requires different legislation for different fishing operations in different areas closer to shore. And so it's a, it is a, a sort of a miasma in political, economic, 
uh, global market structures that uh, prevent any easy answer from really surfacing. But uh, one, one uh, effort that is being done is doing freeze-dried fish, and they are introducing them uh, as snack food to children in impoverished areas of Africa and up in the highlands of Atacama and Ecuador and Peru and Chile. And these are uh, traditionally populations that don't have much protein in their diet, no omega-3s, and they've introduced them just as snack food. And uh, the popularity is wildly catching on. And um, so should Peruvian anchovetos be freeze-dried and fed to African inland villages? Well, you know, that's another conversation, but these efforts are underway. Sir? And then I believe that we're uh, just about at time. And then, uh, great. <laughs> Great question. Long answer. Yes. <laughs> um, and I will first caveat that with I am not an expert on uh, Fukushima or nuclear uh, waste at all, but um, my understanding of it is that uh, because of the very high doses of radiation right next to the uh, plant, there is elevated levels of um, radiation there. However, the ocean is a very vast place, and um, it has been able the the levels that are that we are seeing sort of on the west coast. Although they're detectable, they are not above um, sort of any baseline levels that we have seen in the past. Um, in terms of climate change, uh, ocean acidification is. Um, obviously one of the most concerning factors and that really will, although it will impact many species, it's really going to have um, probably most impact on the species that form, um, form shells, so uh, crustaceans and mollusks because it makes them, uh, it makes it more difficult for them to form their exoskeletons. Um, but climate change will also influence how, uh, where these populations are. Um, particularly of fish that are able to move. So we're probably going to see um, a shift in species distributions. Um, for instance, we're already seeing this on the east coast of the United States where uh, fish that we normally saw down sort of more in the Caribbean around Florida or in the mid-Atlantic are moving up towards New England. Um, so that's kind of a short answer. <laughs> and that, that's really one of the, the issues that we don't tend to see in the media is that um, with shifting weather patterns, uh, evolution is so brilliant in the way that everything has come together that this flock, you know, this uh, migratory group of ladybugs happens to pass through this area at just this perfect time when this, pl this plant is blooming and these birds are coming in directly. You know, there's such an interrelated uh, you know, correlation between everything and, and you know, Everything's purpose in, in life is, is to feed its own needs while providing for the needs of others. And once you begin to shift those uh, timings and, and places, uh, we're going to see some cascades that I, I don't think we have any ability to forecast. Oil spills, um, you know, I think uh, you know, they, they are limited events, uh, but fortunately they are long lasting in our emotional memories. And, uh, you know, I, I'm never going to say I hope for more of them, but I hope that the ones that we had, you know, really spurred people to act and understand that we we are wholly dependent as life forms on the health of the ocean, and we are acting very irrationally with our own security. And I'll just add quickly too that um, you know I spoke a lot about sort of those El Nino events and the longer term cycles that impact fish populations. It's likely that those kinds of events are going to become more unpredictable with climate change. It makes it even more difficult for us to manage these fish populations. Thank you to Tess. <laughs> So thank you all very much for being here for our lecture. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I actually had the privilege of hearing Tess sort of do a practice run earlier today, and I was doing a lot of, really? 
Um, when I was listening to her earlier, I'm sure many of you had that same reaction this evening. So thank you again to Tass and to Barton um, for such great information. And uh, all of our lectures are listed on the website. They are free to the public. And we hope you will join us for future lectures. Thank you.